Hello everyone, I am Dr. Lusheen and this is lecture 14 for Safety 380, Introduction to Occupational Safety and Health. In this lecture I'm going to cover kind of a wide range of approaches to um, inspections, auditing, accident investigations, and follow-up. Um, it is the quintessential uh, duty of the safety professional to continually audit their work environment uh, for sources of harm, hazard, risk, injury, and attempt to remediate it. But if someone does get injured, that we do a, an, an unbiased and uh, fair investigation to figure out what we can do to prevent it from happening again. So with that, let's get to it. So I, I kind of put this together because I wanted to discuss a few things. Um, there are many different methods that we use, and I'm going to cover a lot of them here. The textbook covers a lot of them. The OSHA website covers a lot of them. And you may be questioning, well, why so many? Because each in its own right has advantages and disadvantages. And it's really difficult to understand all things that can cause harm because things are always changing. Um, and so if you do like a visual inspection, it's only valid for the time window in which you conduct it. And it's how, how, how effective it is, is based on the expertise of the individual. And then there are more systems or team approaches that look at programs and use more sophistication or technology. And, but those are really expensive and takes a lot of time. So there are, you know, from the simple to advanced, um, all provide an insight into what could hurt people at work. And we need them all. And we need to do them over time. I wouldn't say continuously, but regularly. And through that effort, we should be able to, at some point, um, reach a satisfiable condition in which people are less likely to get hurt. So let's cover all this stuff. Please read chapters 7, 9, and 10. Not read to memorize, but read to understand. You Not understand, just to kind of a low level of what's going on. Because we'll probably be coming back to this material throughout the semester now because we're going to start getting into um, different types of um, hazards that tend to, to hazards that hurt people and these techniques would help you know will bubble up to the top i also provided some pdfs and some other things for you to look at so i want to go through the so the material as quick as possible because i've got some pictures an example of a, a mock osha audit i had done um, at a workplace like four or five years ago so chapter seven is entitled i think ehs auditing because environmental management or environmental auditing is a, is attempting to identify all sources of, of accidental release. They could go into a water stream, into the air, um, to, into people, and in, in identifying those potential for releases, you put in place controls or redundancies or alarms to alert you um, if something's about to happen or something has happened. Um, and you're also supposed to have a plan of, okay, this comes to our site. This is how we're going to use it. This is how we're going to store it. This is how we're going to control it. And when we're done with it, what are we going to do with it? You know, there has to be a disposal. They call it cradle to grave. In safety, we're trying to identify and mitigate the sources of, of risk or harm that are likely to cause injury, illness, or death. And it's just that it's a there's more complexities to that than the environmental side, but still we use similar auditing techniques. It's meant to be a continuous improvement. Uh, chapter seven, we'll get into this. I've got some cool little pictures here and everything, but it it tends to align with um, if anybody here is familiar with ISO standards, International Standards Organization, where you you document what you do and then you do what you document, and by knowing what conditions should be there and if if a condition is different or if what you expect is changing you have to get in there and understand what to do do i need to bring it back to its state that it's supposed to be in or is this alternate state going to be a regularity if so then we have to bring it into the full it, it, so i'm speaking in generalities and i'm sorry but um, that's really what it's about. It's 
documenting, documenting. If somebody does get hurt, we have to do a fair and unbiased accident investigation to get to the root cause. And I've got down here a link and I've provided a, uh, a document from OSHA to you on root cause analysis. Just another tool in the toolbox, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, but what I wanna get back to is not to assign fault. As humans, we tend to, we naturally, our default, our default condition is to blame the worker for getting hurt because we attempt to understand how the person could have exposed themselves or allowed themselves to be exposed to danger that resulted in them getting hurt. Therefore, we blame them for not acting to prevent it. But what we don't realize is humans are very um, limited in our ability to understand when we're in harm's way. And another thing too is we focus on the work or the task at hand and sometimes that blinds us. Another is what if we had done it before and we didn't get hurt and now we're underestimating what the risk is. All these things contribute to why someone might get hurt. A safety professional needs to understand that and try to design the work so that they don't have to think about it. Or if they do, there's something there to allow it to happen. Um, and we'll get into that later in the semester. Conducting investigation should be a systematic process. You gather evidence, try to find out why it happened, not just what happened, like the OSHA 301, that was just what happened. Um, and last lecture, we talked about the WKC 12, which is the first report of injury for work comp in Wisconsin. Um, that doesn't always go as far enough as to find out why, because if you can look beyond the worker and attempt to find out why it occurred, that gives you more insight into how it could be resolved um, in the future. Because I'm an engineer, I can say this, and that is that engineers are not trained to think of workers when they design things. I know this. Um, they're designed to think about production. The, the, the technology doing what it's supposed to do. And the person is just a cog in a bigger machine, but you can't think that way. And so they created these system safety approaches for engineers to at least have them, to remind them to acknowledge that a human is a human. Yeah. <laughs> There's two kind of opposing ways to approach a problem, and I'm just gonna cover them quick because it's in the chapter, and that is inductive which you observe something and then you attempt to look for patterns and then you theorize this is why it happens. In doing that now you can fix things in multiple places in similar approaches. The other side of it is to start at a theory that this is the way people are and then go out and test it to confirm whether it does occur or not and then if so you can proceed with corrective action. The cost effective method uh, I tend to implement this near the tail end of my work uh, when it comes to prioritizing and planning out how I'm going to present recommendations to management. But, you know, you all are, a lot of you are, are general business majors and HR majors, so you probably already understand the, the idea of when you make a recommendation to management, there should be a return on investment attached to it. Ah, job safety analyses. These tend to be cyclic in nature. You basically identify a job and then you break it down into its steps or individual parts from start to finish and then it should start again. You guys remember talking about um, Taylor at the beginning of the semester? It's what he kind of did. It's like an industrial engineering approach. Um, but then within each of those steps you try to identify where a person could get hurt, how could they get hurt, and then you try to resolve it in the step. It's just it's attempting to make something big and complex down to something you can break down. The solutions, uh, chapter 9 gets into this. One thing that safety professionals sometimes forget is they're so focused on the safety, controlling that, that they forget that the safety may actually interrupt or affect the work, the production, what the person's doing, the task. And so if they just take it and they just throw it at them and go, okay, hey, I fixed it, I fixed the safety. If you, if you affected the work or the task or the worker's ability to complete the task, they're gonna have to choose. And what are they gonna choose? They're gonna choose to get the work done or the task done. And so they're going to get exposed to the issue. And then you'll probably come back and blame them. Oh, why didn't you do the thing I told you to? Well, you didn't do your job, safety professional. You didn't attempt to understand how safety has to be integrated into the work itself. There was a study done years ago that showed that. And I, th I think that's always interesting. 
visual inspections is what uh, an OSHA inspection basically is. And um, yeah, I've got some things here. It tends to, it's limited because you're only seeing it for that time in which you're there. And its effectiveness is based on the expertise of the person doing it. It takes documentation and everything. It's the simplest thing you can do, but it tends to be the least effective. Whereas the most effective is very time consuming and resource heavy. And so you kind of have to do everything. So once you've identified things, uh, you have to kind of break it down to what it is and document it. Chapter 10 has all kinds of checklists and forms you can use. I don't like those because I have my own technique. But when you start out, sometimes it's good to do that and to customize them. And then to prioritize, you can use different forms of either a, a risk assessment matrix. Um, you can use a lot of different things. I tend to prioritize based on cost or the potential for harm. That's me. Um, and we want to look at the hierarchy of controls as well. We'd like to eliminate. If we can eliminate the hazard or the exposure to the hazard, no injury will occur. But if we have to do a substitution, that would be maybe a less severe outcome. Engineering controls, it's still there. We're isolating it or, or, or blocking it, but they could still possibly get to it. Administrative controls and PPE, ah, you get lucky most of the time, I think is what I'd say. Let's look at some pictures. <laughs> You got a gentleman here. Well, I don't know what kind of work he's doing, but he's on a ladder jack scaffold. These are basically illegal um, by OSHA standards. So he's probably you know three or four stories up. If he was to lose his balance and not be able to grab onto anything, he'd fall to the ground, um, and that would be that. So he needs either, well, one, you really shouldn't be using this type of equipment if you're working, if you're at home, whatever. Um, but you need either a personal fall arrest system that would catch you or guard railings or something like a net. Same with this guy, window washer. He's just out on a ledge. He loses balance and can't grab it on anything. Um, it's not the fall that'll kill him. It's that quick stop at the bottom, followed by a splat. Same thing here. Person's on an A-frame ladder, standing at the top of it, which increases the likelihood of it tipping, by the way. And he's not just going to fall the height of the ladder. It's going to be all the way to the floor of the rotunda. Here you've got some gentlemen being a MacGyver. They're working from the you know the, the 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 forks of a bobcat, and that's not what it's designed for. It may work once in a while, but it's not what it's designed for. You could fall. These gentlemen have personal fall arrest systems on. It's not tied off to anything, so if they go over the edge, it's the ground that's going to catch them. Uh, we have a gentleman here in a trench. Uh, the trench is not sh is not sloped properly, so there could be engulfment. And you've got people up above there too. Geez, um, so you either you have to put in a um, what I just say um, a slope, or you have to put in um, a barrier in case the walls were to collapse, they would hit it. They call that shoring. Here they put in a. <laughs> what's meant to be sort of a chain gate, but it's so low somebody would trip over it and fall. Here's an access point to a roof, but it doesn't have something that extends uh, 36 inches up so the person can hit you, follow three point contact all the way till they get to the next surface and step off. This is such a common thing. This is compressed air for cleaning. Under 1910, I think 242B, um, it has to be regulated to either 35 psi or below, or if it's above, that has to have a, has a have a dead end release. Find them all the time. I find this all the time too. Outlet cover um, is missing, and you can kind of see the two poles on the outlet itself. Those are live. So if somebody was to reach in there and touch that, they would get shocked. Uh, upper right hand corner, you see that uh, one of the outlets has experienced an arc flash which means the equipment's damaged. Um, this could either cause a fire if used or possibly harm somebody. Here they've got a refrigerator plugged into a multi-strip. That's not what it's designed for. Multi-strips like this are used, supposed to be used for computer equipment or AV equipment, really low voltage stuff. A refrigerator is a high voltage piece of equipment that you could easily burn this out. And when you've got wires hanging around a, whether it's a, a metal cabinet, metal shelving, um, or a fence like this, if the cord was be, was to become the insulation on the cord was to become damaged and contact the the metal, it would electrify it. The next person to touch it would become part of that circuit. 
here's a gas can, but it isn't a legal gas can. Um, it doesn't have the components. So if this was to tip over, it would spill. A, a, it should be self-closing. It should have spark arrest. It should, every, all part of it should be metal and not the plastic nozzle in the front. You can have them at home and have them at the workplace. This was an interesting one that I came across. Um, I went up there. You can kind of see there's, fi there's fingerprints. I, I took a test and sniffed it, and it was metal fume. And metal fume should not be in this workplace. So I started asking around, found out that they had a contractor in several weeks ago before this, and they were doing some welding on some um, dirty steel, which was the standpipe for the um, fire suppression system in the building. They had some upgrades. And um, they didn't shut off the HVAC, and they didn't isolate the um, the smoke that was coming, the fume from the weld. So they called up the contractor. They had to pay to have the um, ducts cleaned out. This gentleman here is using a um, gas-powered saw to cut concrete. Uh, that dust you see is silica dust. It causes lung cancer, and he's smoking. This was a water leak, and you can see there's been some mold growth. Um, mold is not really too big of a concern for me if it's a small amount. Um, so you even see black mold, and I know that you've heard, oh, black mold, it kills humans. Um, no, if you really read the research, what it is, certain strains of mold, when they have a constant source of, um, of water, and they have a cellulose place in which to grow, when when the mold itself is competing for food and water, it releases a mycotoxin to, in order to fight with other molds. Now it's that mycotoxin in the air that can be hazardous to humans, not the mold themselves. We tend to be allergic to it at different concentrations, but we're breathing it in right now and we're okay. This guy's not okay. He, uh, he couldn't find a face mask or goggles and so he put a bag around his face. Um, I think he's barefoot too. Um, <laughs> all right, so before I move into the next part, this is the review. I want you to read those three chapters, take a look at the PDFs that I posted from the OSHA website. It should be enough to get you at least familiar with the different types of approaches and what they're all about. Here's what I provided to you on the uh, Canvas site. You see all the OSHA forms under the readings. And then I also provided some other uh, documents that I had created through consulting, starting with the first one there is a, is a work accident. I want you to look at that and see if you can identify the root cause without blaming the victim. Then we've got my reports, and at the bottom I've got some bonus videos. Please check those out. So let's go over a report I wrote um, back in 2015. So that's eh, five years ago-ish, sure. So I'm very meticulous when I do this type of work. Um, when I'm there, what I'm doing when I'm there, what I do to prepare. All these things are have to be documented, which is a big part of auditing. Uh, so here's some of the site description. I did a comparison between the company and their industry peers, as you can see here. Shows here that their in injury rates are higher than their peers. Here's the actual data. And what's interesting, I want to make note of this, is um, causes. We have a puncture in 2011, that was $22,000 probably damaged something. And then we have nail and head. That was only 3,600. Laceration sliver. Just so you know we're getting into. I do a, an extensive program review. I actually read it. Some companies, they create it and they don't read it. And I always make comments on it. And I try to approach it from the perspective of a new worker. Reading this, does this really give me the insight and knowledge I need to be safe when I'm out on the floor? Do I know what I need to do? So let's look at some pictures here. So as you can see, there's a lot of sawdust and, and leftover wood pieces and extension cords and tools strewn about the floor. So tripping hazards and stuff like that. Um, and I put one on here for portable equipment because look, after they use a circular saw, they set it down on the cord itself. And you can see I even pointed here on the screen that there's a damaged cord that's exposed electrical. I actually observed on almost accident, a near miss here, um, a piece fell when they tried to set it up against the wall. You have to secure things when they're in storage, and that's what this was. And I got a pointing the guy who was lucky. It just missed his head. Just missed it. One of those where it makes a big noise, everybody looks around, and they just, oh, nobody got hurt, so let's just move on. Um, they should have something up there to hold that from sliding. Okay, so here's another interesting thing. 
they use this overhead hoist to move the wall sections from one side of the um, production to the other. And you can see on the right, we have a guy standing right underneath it. But what they don't know is on the left, that latch is broken. If this thing, while in motion, was to jump, and that piece was just to move up like a centimeter, it could jump off that, that hook and land right on that individual. Um, just observing their work techniques and using pneumatic um, nailers, I saw a lot of potential for eye injuries, um, nails into the head, nails into the hand, and we saw from the injury reports that that can happen. Also, they tend to jump up on the work table sometimes to get some work done, and people could fall and get hurt. You guys remember this from the homework? Uh, you guys actually looked up what's required for first aid kits. It looks pretty good, but I did find some blood in there um, that needed to be cleaned up. But they also had an oxygen tank, which was only at about a quarter fill. Um, I was wondering why they had that, because I didn't see any types of hazards that would necessitate the need for oxygen. They use LP or liquid petroleum for their fork trucks. They do keep them outside, caged in, which is great, but it's not labeled. It needed its labels. Here we had floor loading. It had no rating. Um, almost looked like they built it themselves. You got some com air compressors up there. You don't want to create a hazard through storage. Here they had some blocked uh, electrical panels. You need clearance to, you need to get, when you need to get to it, you need to get to it now. And uh, they're blocked. Here we had some um, equipment plugged into a multi-strip. Can't do that, not designed for it. Here we had a plastic gas can, can't have that. We just had a lot of stuff strewn about. These chemicals, you know, you don't want them to, you don't want them to combine or leak, cause a fire hazard or an inhalation hazard. You got a, a Mountain Dew can sitting there right in the middle. We did noise monitoring for them, pneumatic tools, nailers, saws, all that stuff really loud. So we came back and did noise monitoring for them. Here was their uh, homemade dust collection system, which is a good thing but it was leaking, and so potential for explosion. Um, good, this is working. Um, the last two times I tried to record this video, this is where everything went crazy because I had some videos accidentally put in here. Um, they're not here, yay! So this is working. So they had a lot of saws. Upcut saws, they had radial alarm saws, and they had table saws without guards. And just like this picture in the middle, which isn't actual, I, I took this to show you, an exposed blade and hand don't mix. And in each, I had video of each of these different types of saws here really close to people's hands. Um, they thought they had guards in place. Those guards were, no, people's hands were still, hands and wrists were really close to getting nicked. And that scared me. And I scared them because of it. <laughs> you guys can't, you guys are going to have a worker lose a finger and that's going to be very costly. And then I actually gave them guarding options. You can see here, there's things you can do. Things that self move while they're being used. So I gave them a summary. I gave the high priority violations, injury concerns and recommended program development, what they should do. And then I was there to help them as well. And I was gonna give them a final report. So that's everything. Please watch the other videos and read the other stuff. We'll be going, I have a lot more stuff to share with you, but we're already over 23 minutes. So we'll leave it there. Let me know if you have any questions. Hope this, is, hope this was insightful um, as we continue in this course. And we're going to start getting into specific hazards here in just a few more lessons.